Right now you're waking up to a snowy forecast. Gary Canalti has your first alert forecast. It's election week. Madison's primary is just two days away. What to know before heading to the polls. Plus the latest on a fire in Edgerton late last night. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now This Morning. Good morning. It's 6.30 in the morning on February 17th. I'm Madeline O'Neill in for Josh, joined by Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti. We got some snow out there, that's for sure. Yeah, we missed it coming in, but it's snowing out there pretty steadily right now. And in fact, we have alert days in the forecast for today and also for another weather system from Tuesday night into Wednesday that could bring several inches of snow accumulation as well. Now you can see on Doppler track the snow overspreading much of southern Wisconsin. The brighter bands of blue are where the heaviest snow is falling. And by taking a look at the visibilities, you can see the lower the visibility, that's where the heaviest snow is. So it's basically a band right along the Wisconsin River through Madison and down toward Janesville where visibilities are between about a mile and a half and a mile. Current temperatures are in the lower 20s, a few upper teens where the snow is just starting in the northern parts of our viewing area. Temperatures will slowly climb to the middle 20s by late afternoon, but expect a steady light snow for much of the day today. And that could make some impacts on travel. Uh, first alert traffic this morning already starting to see uh, a few delays. Uh, right now, that's the Beltline and Todd Drive. You can see the Beltline becoming snow covered right now. Uh, looks like there is uh, some kind of a, a traffic in incident uh, right there on the Beltline uh, westbound. Looks like a stalled vehicle uh, just uh, prior to the uh, West Broadway uh, exit there. Uh, Traffic slowdowns at times are on Verona Road and also on I-39-9094 uh, uh, on the east side of Madison. Uh, south of Madison, some delays heading between Janesville and Beloit, southbound on the interstate, and a few delays northbound on I-39 heading out of Dane County into the southern portion of Columbia County. That's your first alert traffic. All right, thanks so much, Gary. Now topping the news this half hour, we're expecting to learn more information today about a fire in Edgerton. Crews responded to a residential fire in the 1000 block of Dalman Road last night around 845. Several departments from the area were called in to help fight the fire. Stay with News 3 now and Channel 3000 as we learn more. And new this morning from the Madison Police Department. Officers are looking for a man who allegedly robbed another man at gunpoint on the city's south side. Just before 2 o'clock this morning, a man was walking along the 300 block of Kent Lane when the suspect made a comment about a woman the victim knew. That's when the suspect pointed a handgun at him and demanded his wallet. The victim gave him some money but kept the wallet. Officers say the suspect ran away to a nearby apartment complex. Anyone with information regarding the robbery should call the Madison Police Department. Madison Police are also investigating a robbery at the Capitol Petro on the 6700 block of Mineral Point Road. That's not far from West Town Mall. It happened around 715 last night. Officers say the robber went into the store armed with a short barreled rifle and demanded money. They did get away with some. Anyone with information related to the robbery is asked to call the Madison Area Crime Stoppers. Authorities at the Dane County Jail are looking for an inmate who ran away yesterday afternoon. They say 36-year-old Aaron Keel of Madison was on a work release but never returned. He's currently serving several sentences for drugs, battery, and damage to property. Anyone with inf information is asked to call 911. With just two days until this month's primary elections, all Dane County voters will have access to ballots in Spanish. Currently, the town of Madison is the only jurisdiction in the county to offer Spanish ballots, so next week's vote will be historic for the county. If you or someone you know needs a bilingual ballot, they're available on the Handicap Accessible Machines. Voters simply need to select their language of choice, similar to how it works at an ATM. You can vote in the spring primary on February 19th, that's Tuesday. The packed race for Madison mayor will be dwindled down to two after that primary. Our Keeley Arthur spoke with the candidates and has their goals and visions for the city. Former Alder Satya Rhodes Conway, current city Alder Mo Cheeks, and Rod Shukla, an executive director of a conservation group, sharing why they want to be mayor of Madison. For the past 13 years, I've been the managing director of the Mayor's Innovation Project, which is a national learning network for mayors and their staff. So it is literally my job to answer questions from mayors from all around the country and help them work on policy and programs and implementation. I am 
uh, the executive director of a statewide water policy group. We have uh, worked with legislators of both parties across the state to craft legislation and advance clean water policy from everywhere from Oneida County to Marathon County to the Fox Valley um, to the Central Sands. Um, because of that role, I, it's my responsibility to articulate a vision to lead and manage a talented team of professionals and to make really difficult decisions when your budget and your priorities don't always match. And that's what we have facing us right now. My experience leading in the public sector, my experience leading in the private sector, and my experience uh, uh, being an advocate for, for our schools it, uh, uniquely situates me to be able to uh, address this ongoing challenge that we have as a community of this sort of tale of two cities, right? And that's, um, that, that's what we're working on here in Madison, is trying to live up to our progressive ideals, and I'm ready for that job. Right in candidate Toriana Petaway, who fell one signature short on her nominating petitions, serves as the city's racial equity coordinator. She says she wants to have a bigger impact on the city. You know, I started um, working in this position and I realized that the impact that I am trying to have inside was not um, what I thought it was going to be. And as I worked, I realized that you know what, I, I need to be leading. I need to be leading at a higher level. Longtime Madison Mayor Paul Soglin, who served terms in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and back again since 2011, touched on his leadership in a number of ways, including racial equity within city employment, as just one of the reasons why he is qualified to continue. The city took steps backwards in the 14, 15 years that I was gone in terms of our own policies in regards to hiring. If you look at all the folks that I've, I've hired uh, in department and division head positions and the way we've reinvigorated recruitment for diversity in city employment, we've made tremendous strides. Keely Arthur, News 3 Now. Nick Hart was unavailable for the interview. Again, the primary vote is this Tuesday and with two and the two with the most votes will advance to the general election on April 2nd. For more of Keeley's interview, head to channel3000.com. Now, an annual utility charge could triple for Middleton homeowners to help pay for flood damage. The city estimates last summer's weather did about $5 million worth of damage to stormwater management facilities, including at Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor, Tiedemann Pond, and Stricker Pond. A referendum will ask voters whether they approve tripling the annual stormwater utility charge for the next five years to help pay for repairs. That means it would go from $15 to $45 for homeowners through 2024. While some council members think it's the best way to get places like the Pheasant Branch Conservancy back to normal, others think they're jumping in too quickly. I feel like all of us are missing out and that vitality that brought us to Middleton and so many of our neighbors and businesses mm -hmm. and um, just so that we can get out and be a community again. I love Nature Conservancy. I'm not opposed to paying for it. But uh, but we are not ready for it. We should have we should have the numbers and how much it is going to cost. Middleton's Mayor Gertie Brar would like to know how much money the city is getting from FEMA and other grants before asking taxpayers to contribute. Voters will get their say on the April 2nd ballot. More local news now. Students and staff at the Madison School District will have two days added to their school year along with longer days to make up for all the recent snow days. Full classes are now scheduled for March 18th and June 12th. Starting next week on February 25th, elementary school students will add 11 minutes to their school day and middle and high schoolers will add seven. Parents, you can find all those specifics over at channel3000.com. A new program will launch in the next few months in Wisconsin to connect military spouses with employment opportunities. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce Hiring Our Heroes program is a joint effort with the Department of Workforce Development and Veteran Affairs and the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Matching those spouses with local and national employers, educational institutions, and community resources. Each zone is finding the right local solutions and in the process is making a nationwide impact. Today, we lay the foundation for Wisconsin to receive this designation in June, and I am excited for this opportunity to amplify the barriers unique to our incredible guard and reserve families as well. 
Military spouses have an unemployment rate roughly four times the national average due to constant relocation and gaps in their employment. Now, apparently, CBD oil isn't just for humans anymore. Now, people are using it to treat a variety of ailments for their pets. Holistic veterinarian Dr. Carrie Donahue is a big fan of the stuff for the animals. At her Full Circle Clinic on Monroe Street, pet owners can choose from a variety of CBD oils she sells. She recommends it for a number of pet problems from seizures to arthritis to anxiety. It really does help all of those issues. I can't say across the board that it's going to make a large difference, a small difference. It might make no difference in your pet. But in the cases in pets that I've recommended to use it, it really does usually have some effect that's visible. For cats and small dogs, Dr. Donahue stresses the importance of using CBD oil specifically produced for pets and as always check with your vet before using any medications or supplements. Ahead at 7 this morning Mark Kane will introduce us to one dog owner who's sold on the hemp abstract. And here's some more much needed proof that spring is just around the corner. The entire Brewers lineup will arrive this week in Phoenix for the start of spring training. Equipment trucks carrying all the team's gear left Miller Park last week and pitchers and catchers reported this week to the Brewers newly renovated spring training facility in the Phoenix suburbs. The Brew crew will hope to keep up their momentum from last season when they beat the Chicago Cubs to win the NL Central and game within one and make it in with an excuse me, make it within one game of making their first World Series since 1982. The crew's first spring training game will be on February 25th, a little more than a week away. Now here's a live look outside. Gary has your full first alert forecast next.
Well, the snow's falling pretty steadily in the backyard right now. We've probably picked up a little more than an inch of accumulation since it started uh, sometime between about 3.30 and 4 o'clock this morning. We have alert days in the forecast for today for occasional snow that will accumulate 2 to 5 inches by this evening with maybe an additional inch of accumulation tonight. And then another storm system from Tuesday night into Wednesday could bring similar snow totals, maybe even a little bit more depending on the track of that storm. But right now on Doppler tracking, you see the snow pretty widespread over the central portion of the Midwest, including southern Wisconsin. Uh, Visibility is right now running between about a mile and a mile and a half from La Crosse down to Madison and Janesville. That's where the heaviest band of snow is. Depends on where that band will kind of pivot over the next few hours to determine uh, who will get the heaviest amounts of snow. But right now, winter weather advisories are in effect for much of southern Wisconsin, uh, for basically from Dane County to the south and to the west. Uh, a couple of areas under winter storm warnings into parts of Iowa and back into uh, South Dakota. As we take a look at uh, current temperatures right now, they're in the teens and lower 20s. They'll probably climb into the mid 20s here. It's a lot colder to our north and west, though. Temperatures are below zero up into North Dakota. There's a live view from the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison. You can see the snow falling pretty steadily right now. Uh, right now, the temperature 23 degrees in Madison with light snow. Winds out of the east northeast at nine miles per hour gives us a wind chill of 13 degrees. On weather track, a strong jet stream continues to bring impulses of low pressure right across the country, giving us uh, weather systems almost every other day with some light snow. Uh, this storm system, not a major one, but it will bring several inches of snow accumulation. Uh, right now, a little area of low pressure across central portions of Iowa uh, moving eastward. That's what's uh, triggering the snow here. The main area of low pressure will probably reform farther to the south, and that'll take much of the snow with it to the east uh, later on tonight. Current temperatures range from below zero near the U.S.-Canadian border to just above freezing south of the Ohio River. And on future track, you can see that snow continuing steadily through the afternoon, winding down pretty quickly for tonight. Any flurries land early on tomorrow. Then the next weather system starts developing to our south and west and that will get here sometime uh, late Tuesday night into Wednesday. So our forecast includes a winter weather advisory until 3 a.m. tomorrow morning for Dane County and areas to the south and west. Winter weather advisory west of a Platteville to Lone Rock uh, line that until midnight tonight and then east of our viewing area. Winter weather advisory until 6 a.m. for the Milwaukee metro area. Occasional snow this morning. Temperatures climbing to the mid-20s by lunchtime. Look for a high today of 26 degrees with the snow continuing this afternoon. Again, about 2 to 5 inches by evening. Heaviest amounts over Grant County. Tonight, some light snow maybe an inch of accumulation before it tapers to flurries. As we look at uh, future track, the snow will continue pretty steadily through the afternoon, wind down for tonight, and then tomorrow we're just left with clouds with a few breaks in them, but high temperatures in the 20s, about 3 to 6 inches of snow from Madison to the south and west, lesser amounts to the north and east. And the 7 to 10 day forecast, you can see the next weather system with some snow Tuesday night into Wednesday, and that's followed by uh, another weather system next weekend that could be interesting, some mixed precipitation, changing the potential for more snow accumulations on Sunday followed by colder weather for the start of the following week. So again, that active weather pattern continues, Maddie. Uh, we just can't seem to break the pattern here. It's definitely still winter. It is. All right, thanks so much, Gary. Nearly 400 Wisconsin nursing facilities are facing a crisis because of a shortage of workers and the state's low Medicaid reimbursement rate. Healthcare organizations are requesting lawmakers set aside $83 million in the next two year budget to help facilities cover costs and avoid closures. Since 2016, 27 skilled nursing facilities have closed, including eight so far this year. A new report says last year, Wisconsin schools saw a slight decrease in the number of students receiving breakfast through a federally subsidized nutrition program. The Washington-based nonprofit Food Research and Action Center found Wisconsin's participation in the school breakfast program is trailing the rest of the country. 83% of Wisconsin schools participated in the program last year. More than 38 states have 90% or more schools participating. It's been one year since a gunman opened fire on students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, spurring that community to take action, pushing for nationwide change. Next, we're hearing from the founders of the March for Our Lives movement on what they're working to accomplish this year on News 3 This Morning Sunday.
Well, steady snow continues over much of southern Wisconsin. It started a couple of hours ago. It looks like it'll continue for much of the day today. You can see on Doppler track the snow widespread over southern Wisconsin. The heaviest band of snow appears to be uh, just south of Madison from around Lone Rock to, uh, say, around Verona and then just to the north of Janesville, continuing to pivot off toward the north and east. Visibilities right now in that band generally around a mile or just a little bit above, so that's where the snow is falling the heaviest. Otherwise, uh, temperatures aren't going to move very much. They'll eventually climb into the middle 20s by late this afternoon, but uh, we'll see, see about two to five inches of snow accumulation by evening. The heaviest amounts over southwestern Wisconsin may be an additional inch for tonight. Maddie? All right, thank you, Gary. One year ago this week, 17 people lost their lives when a gunman opened fire on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. The tragedy not only transformed that community, but the country too, giving way to a student-fueled movement dedicated to addressing gun violence. Nicole Killian sat down with some of the founding members of the March for Our Lives to see what they are fighting for one year later. There's not a day that goes by where I'm not thinking about all this. For the past year, Matt Deitch and Charlie Mursky have channeled their grief into a mission. Even when March for Our Lives was still in its infant stage, I kind of knew something big was going to happen. And it did. More than a million people around the country demonstrated in the weeks after the Parkland shooting, demanding change. We took that moment. We, we have that recognition of what's important and what the issues are, and now it's about mobilizing and organizing every single day. From road tours and town halls to voter registration drives and lobbying sessions in states and the nation's capital. The work that we're doing every single day is actively saving lives, and that is by far the biggest accomplishment that we've had. Do you consider that the Parkland effect? I've heard it referred to as the Parkland effect, but this is so much more than just Parkland. According to the Giffords Law Center, 26 states and the District of Columbia enacted 67 new gun control laws in 2018, triple the number from the previous year. That is really when things change, is when people understand, elected officials understand what the public is demanding. Enough. We have all had enough. Recently, survivors and students packed a House committee hearing to push for a background checks bill making its way through Congress. Is that something you can support? The problem is it doesn't solve any problem here. We do have universal background checks. So if that bill were to come over to the Senate today, you would vote no? Not unless it figures out a way to address the burden that it puts on a seller. It does kind of shine a light about what kind of work we're going to have to do in the Senate. But Charlie and Matt say the they're committed. There were 300 plus mass shootings last year, and we're talking about the anniversary of one of them. We could pick any day, and it's an anniversary of mass shooting in America. And if that doesn't bother the people watching this, then they are not paying attention. To a fight they say is just beginning. Nicole Killian, CBS News, Washington. For the one-year anniversary of Parkland, students at the school went dark. They didn't do anything or post anything publicly so they could spend time with their families. Now, there's a full hour of news ahead on News 3 Now this morning Sunday. Next, we're running through this morning's top stories, including a preview of the primary elections just two days away. But first, here's a preview of what's to come on an all-new For the Record. Good morning, everybody. Today on For the Record, we will talk about a new book entitled Terrace Tale, Rebel on the River, a story of love, rats, cancer, hoarding. And did I mention love? It's a fascinating story both the tale and the telling. We will also talk about how and why books get published these days with the founder of Wisconsin Publishing Company. My guests are author Judith Gwynn Adrian and Henschel House Publishing President and CEO Kira Henschel. And that's coming up this morning at 1030 on WISC.
Right now, CBD and your pets. Why more vets are encouraging pet owners to use the substance for their animals. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now This Morning. Good morning. It's 7 o'clock on February 17th. I'm Madeline O'Neill in for Josh this morning. We'll get a check on weather with Gary in just a second, but first let's get caught up on today's headlines. Crews responded to a residential fire in the 1000 block of Dalman Road last night around 845. Several departments from the area were called in to help fight the fire. Stay with News 3 now and Channel 3000 as we learn more. With just two weeks until this month's primary elections, all Dane County voters will have access to ballots in Spanish. Currently, the town of Madison is the only jurisdiction in the county to offer Spanish ballots, so next week's vote will be historic for the county. If you or someone you know needs a bilingual ballot, they're available on the handicap accessible machines. Voters simply need to select their language of choice, similar to how an ATM works. You can vote in the spring primary on February 19th. That's Tuesday. Early voting is already underway. A new program will launch in the next few months in Wisconsin to connect military spouses with employment opportunities. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce Hiring Our Heroes program matches those spouses with local and national employers, educational institutions, and community resources. Military spouses have an unemployment rate roughly four times the national average due to constant relocations and gaps in their employment. The program will launch here in Wisconsin this June. Your family's future could include more public transportation, pedestrian crossings, and bike paths if millennials have their way. A state nonprofit surveyed more than 600 college students on two dozen campuses across the state and found that young people are more likely to prefer transportation that doesn't rely on a car. Those resources could also influence their decision on where to work and live after graduation. Now we'll turn it over to Gary. We've got a snowy morning out there. We do, Maddie. In fact, we have an alert day in the forecast for today and also another one for uh, Tuesday night into Wednesday for the potential for a very similar snow accumulation to what we're expecting today. But right now we're expecting about two to five inches of accumulation by this evening, the heaviest amounts over southwestern Wisconsin and maybe an additional inch of snow uh, later on tonight. And then again, that uh, snow uh, system from late Tuesday into Wednesday of uh, this later on this week. You can see the heaviest band of snow just to the south of Madison. That's that darker band of blue right here from just north of Janesville to say around Verona and then over toward uh, just south of Lone Rock. That's lifting off toward the north and east. But if it kind of stays in the same spot there, we could see some heavier snow totals over a shorter period of time. Notice the visibility is lowest in that band, somewhere in the uh, one to one and a half mile range so that the lower the visibility, the uh, heavier the snow is coming down. Current temperatures are generally in low to mid 20s over southern Wisconsin. Still some upper teens from the Dells northward. Otherwise, temperature will gradually climb to the mid-20s by later this afternoon. As far as first alert traffic is concerned, Roads are becoming slippery and snow covered. Uh, seeing a few delays on the Beltline eastbound uh, right around the bend by Gamma Drive. Otherwise, most of the major roads in pretty good shape, not only uh, through Madison, but to the south and to the east and to the north and west. But again, allow yourself some extra travel time. There could be some delays as traffic picks up and roads become slippery. That's your first alert traffic. All right, thanks so much, Gary. Your next trip to Payless could be your last. The footwear chain reportedly plans to close thousands of stores in what could be the largest retail liquidation ever. The Wall Street Journal is reporting Payless will close more than 2,000 stores when it files for bankruptcy later this month. The shoe retailer emerged from bankruptcy protection 18 months ago with nearly $400 million in unpaid loans. Payless, like so many other brick and mortar stores, is being boxed out as more shoppers turn to online retailers like Amazon. More and more consumers are going online because it's just so much easier than going to a bricks and mortar location. It's just changing the psychology of the consumer. Sources say Payless will start running going out of business sales this week. There's a new Goodwill location in Middleton. The store opened Friday over on Century Ave. It'll employ up to 30 people. This makes a dozen Goodwill stores in South Central Wisconsin. Now you've on store shelves or even advertised on TV. It's a cannabis based product derived from hemp, not from a marijuana plant. And it's become so popular that some companies are now manufacturing CBD oil for our pets. But is it safe? Does it work? And what's the proper dose? Our Mark Kane set out to find the answers. I am a believer. Why? Yes. 
Because I've seen its effectiveness for pets for a variety of different situations and medical issues. Holistic veterinarian Dr. Carrie Donahue is a believer in the effectiveness of CBD oil for our furry friends. She started recommending its use for dogs and cats that had seizures. After using it for seizures for a while, started to use it in cases of anxiety. It's very, very helpful in keeping animals calm. Dr. Donahue has also used CBD oil at her Full Circle Holistic Vet Clinic on Monroe Street in Madison for treating immune-related issues, cancer-related inflammations, allergies, arthritis. It almost sounds too good to be true. Yeah, I know, it's true. Autumn Blanchard gives her two dogs, a pug named Mo and a pit bull named Mercy, CBD oil every day. She started using it after Mercy had some cancerous growths removed. It was likely that it was going to come back. It's almost been three years and nothing has returned. She's 13. She's almost, almost 13. 13. You wouldn't yeah. know it. No, we get compliments on her all the time. Um, People think that she is young. She was having a harder time getting like up and down stairs, jumping off and on the bed, um, and now you wouldn't even know. Mo suffered a neck injury, but is now on CBD and is pain-free. CBD oil is derived from the hemp plant. It's legal to manufacture, legal to sell, legal to buy. The product does not contain THC, which gives marijuana psychoactive effects. However, the FDA has yet to approve CBD oil for pets, so many veterinarians can't or won't recommend it, but you can still legally buy it. If you want to try it on your pet, Dr. Donahue suggests you buy only CBD oil made for pet use. The concentrations of the oil are much lower than the human grade. Also, follow the dosage carefully. Overall, it's pretty safe. It's not a miracle supplement, and it's not like in every animal that uses it, you will see such a significant change. Sometimes the changes are very, very subtle. CBD is a great place to start, but it's not just the CBD alone. You know, I think it's very important to take a look at nutrition. Um, supplements are important. Um, so I just think it's kind of putting together the whole picture of things that's really gonna make a difference for your animals. Dr. Donahue gets questions about CBD um, oil every you know, single day, so she right thinks right. it's here to stay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind. I don't think it's across the board something that's going to change everything, but at least you know it's natural, it's not gonna do any harm, and it might have a positive effect. It just might have a positive effect. Just ask Mercy. I'm Mark Kane, News 3 Now. Before you start using CBD oil on your pet, talk to your vet to make sure it doesn't interact with any medication your pets may already be on. As for cost, depending on the size of the pet, CBD oil will cost you about a dollar a day. Now here's a live look outside. Gary has your full first alert forecast next.
Well, snow continues to fall pretty steadily in the News 3 backyard. Uh, it's a little lighter than it was about a half hour ago when I was out here, but it will continue through much of the day. Not particularly heavy at any particular time, but it'll be a consistent uh, light snow through much of the day. You can see a band of snow lifting northward into southern Wisconsin, then just kind of uh, orienting itself from west to east. So uh, as long as that band stays nearly stationary, uh, that will keep the snow going for a while longer. As we zoom out uh, across the Midwest, you can see the snow extends back into parts of Iowa. There's another band uh, developing around Des Moines over toward uh, Cedar Rapids that'll be lifting northeastward. So again, I'm expecting the snow to continue for much of the day. Visibilities generally uh, between about one and three miles from Madison toward the south and west. There's a, a little bit of a break uh, between uh, like around Dubuque, Iowa into uh, east central portions of Iowa uh, where the snow is lightened up a little bit, but then it'll pick up again in intensity. Winter weather advisories in effect basically from Madison on toward the south and west. Winter storm warning back toward uh, the areas uh, north and west of Des Moines. We have alert days in the forecast for today and tonight for about two to five inches of snow accumulation during the day today with the heaviest amounts out toward Grant County and then maybe an additional inch of snow accumulation tonight. But a similar storm system from Tuesday night into Wednesday will bring some accumulating snow. So we have an alert day already in the forecast for that. Live view from the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison. The capital a little easier to see, so the snow has lightened up a bit in intensity. Temperature right now 23 degrees with light snow falling in Madison. Winds out of the east at 10 miles per hour, drop our wind chill to 12 degrees. The uh, storm system responsible for our snow is basically following a very energetic jet stream that divides temperatures that are pretty mild over the far southern parts of the United States to a very cold weather up near the U.S. Canadian border where right now temperatures are around zero. There's a weak area of low pressure over central Iowa that's uh, responsible for our snow. Eventually it will combine with a storm system down in southwestern Kansas and then move almost due east. So the snow will kind of move on out of here and then reform out to the east of us as it catches up with some rain that's already moving through the southeastern portion of the country. Temperatures right now are below zero up in uh, parts of eastern Montana and northwestern North Dakota, generally single digits and teens uh, north of Madison to the south, generally in the 20s to lower 30s. Wind chills right now not terribly bad, but we're seeing some minus teens and, tw and uh, minus 20s for wind chills back into parts of uh, South Dakota and Montana. So it will get a little colder over the next couple of days. Winter weather advice advisory in effect until 3 a.m. tomorrow morning for Dane County and areas to the south of west. Winter weather advisory for our far western viewers until midnight and into the Milwaukee area until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Occasional snow temperatures climbing to around 24 by lunchtime. This afternoon's high temperature topping out at around 26 with the snow continuing through the afternoon. Get about two to five inches by evening at the heaviest amount south and west of Madison. Tonight might see an additional inch of snow accumulation before it tapers to flurries with a low temperature of 14. On future track, the snow continues pretty steadily through the day. High temperatures mid 20 Tonight, the snow starts to taper down after this evening. A couple of flurries could linger to early tomorrow morning with a low of 14 overnight. Tomorrow's high temperature in the lower 20s as we take a look at the expected snowfall, about 3 to 6 inches from Madison on toward the south and west, 1 to 3 inches for our far northern viewers. 7 to 10-day forecast, though, those temperatures generally below normal for the next couple of days. Then that storm system Tuesday night into Wednesday. Another storm for next weekend could bring a mix of precipitation, changing over to accumulating snow on Sunday and then back into the 20s for the start of the next week. So we just can't seem to break that pattern, Maddie. But every two or three days, we got another storm system we have to contend with. Doesn't seem like it's ending. And is spring in sight? And I mean, the next few weeks. Looks yeah, I see spring, slippery. and when I look at the calendar and I see May, and I, that's, that's about the close. <laughs> okay, you know, a couple we, months. We have to get that. We have to get, get rid of some of the snow first. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Gary. We've been asking you to share your mornings with us. We've got a picture this morning. It looks like from. A bird here from Nikki Frisch, one of the few that uh, didn't leave us for the south. I give him credit. Looks like that was during the polar vortex. Thank you for sending that in. What does your morning look like? Take a picture and post it on the Channel 3000 Facebook page or on Twitter using the hashtag MyNews3Morning. We'll share our favorites right here on News 3 Now this morning. We are hearing for the first time from the family of a Green Beret who died during an attack in Afghanistan last year. His name was Eric Emmond, and he was among the first U.S. troops to enter Afghanistan 17 years ago. Between that trip and his most recent, he established an extraordinary legacy. His widow, Allie, is now sharing his story in hopes it will inspire others. Last August, Sergeant First Class Eric Iman left North Carolina for Afghanistan. It was his seventh combat tour. We all went into this deployment thinking it was going to be the last one and he'd come home and get set up to retire. 
On November 27th, his wife, Allie, heard there'd been an attack. It was just a typical morning, trying to get three kids ready. In the morning chaos, I saw on the news, and I tried to shush the kids for a minute, and I stood there, and I thought, yeah, I was like, oh, that's, that's horrible. But nobody called me, so Eric's OK, so all right, come on, girls. Later that afternoon, after she picked up the kids. The doorbell rang, and I had opened the door, not even looking. I. <laughs> And you just, you know, there's not a whole lot of reasons that there'd be two uniformed <laughs> soldiers standing outside of your door. And I just wanted them to say it. Like, just, they have the things that they have to say, but I just, just wanted them to say it. Um, my four-year-old saw the whole thing. Eric Imond had been killed by a roadside bomb in Ghazni province, Afghanistan. He was 39 years old. It was later that night when I had told them, and I just wanted to get it through to them, that dad, like, daddy, daddy's dead. Something really bad happened. And finally, my oldest had said, had looked at me and, and said, he said he was coming home. Allie and her three daughters, ages seven, four, and one, were now a gold star family. For military spouses and children, it is a distinction they never hope to bear. For the Imans, it is also painfully ironic. Back in 2009, Eric suffered a traumatic brain injury after an RPG attack in Afghanistan. While he was recovering, he and others, including his friend Dan Magoon, started an organization called Mass Fallen Heroes to help Gold Star families. It angered Eric that those families were forgotten about when all the pomp and circumstance dies down and the flag is presented and families go on. And then a year passes and it's, it's on to the next story, it's on to the next, the next issue. I'd like to begin by thanking each and every one of you for attending our second annual Fallen Heroes Memorial Gala. For the next eight years, Eric devoted so much of his life to his country and Gold Star families. His death leaves behind a new one. Now, this was their last photo when we brought him to the airport, um, right before we said goodbye. Did Eric ever consider that he might be in the position of the people that he was trying to help? No, I never thought it. No. Um, it was something that I think we took for granted. Mass Fallen Heroes has supported Allie and the girls every step of the way. In May, Eric's name will appear on the country's first memorial for U.S. troops killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Located in his home state, it's in downtown Boston. Eric helped build it. What do you want people to know about Eric? Every choice he made was for other people, was for the betterment of others, whether it be his family or his country. I was able to meet Marines that he served with, and they would say to me, he made me the person I am. And all I could say back was, was me too. He was an incredible person. He couldn't have been a better man. And I guess I just want people to know that. A new study shows that members of the LGBTQ community may not be getting the same health care as other Americans. And a measles outbreak is spreading across the country. What Wisconsin doctors want you to know and what they're urging you to do. This morning's top health stories are just ahead on News 3 Now this morning Sunday.
Well, the snow continues for this morning. It's going to continue uh, through tonight. We have an alert day in the forecast for today and tonight for accumulating snow that might end up in the three to six inch range and all is said and done through tonight. And then an additional storm system from Tuesday night into Wednesday could bring some more snow. So we have an alert day in the forecast for that. Right now, snow pretty steady over much of southern Wisconsin. It looks like there might be a little bit of a break south of a Platteville to Monroe line, but otherwise look for those visibilities right now here in Madison down to about three quarters of a mile to continue fairly low with the uh, snow continuing temperatures right now in the lower 20s. Look for temperatures to climb in the mid 20s with the steady light snow continuing through the day. Maddie, Gary, thank you. Topping this morning's health headlines. If you or your loved one belongs to the LGBTQ community, chances are they might be getting less health care. Wisconsin Public Radio is reporting on a new survey that shows nearly one in five LGBTQ adults don't go to the doctor because they're afraid of discrimination. That community also faces higher instances of mental illness, HIV, and more. Studies also show doctors feel less than prepared to handle the health needs of the LGBTQ population. Doctors in 10 different states are now dealing with a measles outbreak as close as Illinois. While there haven't been any cases reported here in Wisconsin, medical experts are urging you and your kids to get vaccinated. Measles is even more contagious than the flu, and getting vaccinated is 95% effective in protecting you from it. There are people who insist on not getting the shot, but doctors say avoiding the vaccine isn't just about your family's well-being. The shot can prevent the disease from rapidly spreading here in Wisconsin. I'm trying to convince the parents that like seatbelts, that some people say I'm not going to wear a seatbelt because I heard about someone who died in a car crash and their car got on fire and they couldn't get out of their car. We know that seatbelts saves lives. They don't save 100% of lives, but they save lives. If you or your child have measles symptoms like a fever, cough, and a rash, doctors say you shouldn't rush to the hospital because of how contagious it is. Instead, give your physician a call to determine the best course of action. Meanwhile, Republican lawmakers are circulating a bill that would prohibit minors from buying e-cigarettes and other vaping products. That measure would set the minimum age for buying those items at 18 and prevent stores from selling things like vape pens to anyone younger than that. While current state law bars retailers and manufacturers from selling tobacco or nicotine products to minors. Legislators said in a memo that it's often impossible to tell whether vaping devices contain tobacco. And even if they don't, using them can lead to tobacco use. Doctors here in Wisconsin are prescribing fewer painkillers, but that doesn't mean fewer people are dying from opioid overdoses. A state report found a nearly 30% drop in those prescriptions over the past three years. Still, state health officials say more than 900 people died from an overdose back in 2017. A report last fall said the life expectancy of people across the country actually dropped due in part to drug overdose deaths. Wisconsin Public Radio reports people who can't access painkillers could turn to heroin laced with fentanyl. And because that drug is so potent, those people are more likely to overdose. Just last week, U.S. attorneys sent letters to about 180 physicians and nurses across Wisconsin who are prescribing opioids at a higher level than their colleagues. And a new study comparing the health records of cities across the country has us in the top 20%. Wallet Hub looked at multiple indicators of good health in more than 170 U.S. cities. Things like the cost of a medical visit and how much fruit and vegetables are eaten and fitness clubs per capita. Madison is ranked 31st. The number one healthiest city was San Francisco. The only other Wisconsin city included in the study was Milwaukee, which was ranked at 92nd. There's a half hour of news still ahead here on News 3 Now this morning, Sunday. Next, we're running through this morning's top stories, including the latest store to file for bankruptcy, becoming the largest chain to do so ever. And then we're heading under the sea, checking in on the search for a missing aircraft carrier that hasn't seen daylight for nearly eight decades. We'll be right back.
Now a search 77 years in progress. We take along on the hunt to find the USS Hornet, the last American aircraft carrier to go down in battle. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now This Morning. Good morning. It's 7.30 on February 17th. I'm Madeline O'Neill in for Josh this morning. We'll get a check on weather with Gary in just a second, but first let's get caught up on today's headlines. Officers are looking for a man who allegedly robbed another man at gunpoint on the city's south side just before 2 o'clock this morning. A man was walking along the 300 block of Kent Lane when the suspect made a comment about a woman the victim knew. That's when the suspect pointed a handgun at him and demanded his wallet. The victim gave him some money but kept the wallet. Officers say the suspect ran away to a nearby apartment complex. Anyone with information regarding the robbery should call the Madison Police Department. An annual utility charge could triple for Middleton homeowners to help pay for flood damage. The city estimates last summer's weather did about $5 million worth of damage to stormwater management facilities, including at Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor, Tiedemann Pond, and Stricker Pond. A referendum will ask voters whether they approve tripling the annual stormwater utility charge for the next five years to help pay for repairs. That means it would go from $15 to $45 for homeowners through 2024. Your next trip to Payless could be your last. And if you head there this week, you could snag some big deals. The footwear chain reportedly plans to close thousands of stores in what could be the largest retail liquidation ever. The Wall Street Journal is reporting Payless will close more than 2,000 stores when it files for bankruptcy later this month. The shoe retailer emerged from bankruptcy protection 18 months ago with nearly $400 million in unpaid loans. And here's some more much needed proof that spring is just around the corner. The entire Brewers lineup will arrive this week in Phoenix for the start of spring training. Equipment trunks carrying all the team's gear left Miller Park last week and pitchers and catchers reported this week to the Brewers newly renovated spring training facility in the Phoenix suburbs. The Brew crew will hope to keep up their momentum from last season when they beat the Chicago Cubs to win the NL Central. The crew's first spring training game will be on February 20th. 25th, a little more than one week away. Now we'll turn it over to Gary, who's uh, monitoring the snowy situation we got this morning. Hey, Gary. Maddie, you just had to put that thing in there about the, the Brewers beating the Cubs <laughs> last year. Just well, for you, Gary. <laughs> well, we're far from baseball weather yet. Opening day at Miller Park is in late March, and uh, at least they have a roof where they can be closed. We still have snow, and we've, we're adding to what's on the ground. Uh, occasional snow today, about two to five inches by this evening, and maybe an additional inch for tonight for about a two to six inch range through much of southern Wisconsin. So an alert day in the forecast for today and tonight. Also an alert day in the forecast for Tuesday night into Wednesday for a similar storm system that could bring additional accumulating snow. Notice this band of snow. It's worked in the southern Wisconsin. have kindly become stationary while a second band develops in Iowa and heads in our direction. In between, there's a little bit of a break over far southwestern Wisconsin where the snow has lightened up. Visibility you notice in Platteville at 10 miles with very little snow there, but down to a mile in Madison and Lone Rock and Mineral Point, so the snow falling pretty steadily there. Temperatures gradually getting up into the mid-20s this afternoon. At least the cloud cover will keep them from falling off too much for tonight, but as we take a look at uh, News 3 Now First Alert traffic, unfortunately with the snow on the highways, that's going to make for slip travel, uh, travel conditions. That's the Beltline at Todd Drive right now. Uh, pretty well snow covered. In fact, there's an accident on the Beltline uh, ramp from uh, the westbound Beltline to uh, Fish Hatchery Road. Also some slowdowns on Verona Road southbound from the Beltline. If you're traveling uh, south of Madison, seeing Traffic just below the posted speed limits on I-3990 down to uh, Beloit, uh, US-12 to Whitewater and I-94 toward Milwaukee. North of Madison, pretty much the same story. Traffic just below the posted speed limits. Allow yourself some extra travel time and keep it slow on the slippery covered roads. That's your first alert traffic. All right, Gary, you're right. Not quite baseball weather yet. All right, thanks so much. Well, we talk a lot about keeping lake levels under control here in Dane County. Experts say the Great Lakes could be seeing record-setting levels as well this summer. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers office in Detroit issued a six-month forecast for the lakes, and that report predicts above-normal levels for most of the Great Lakes. Lakes Superior and Erie could both set records in Lake Spring. Lakes Huron and Michigan are also expected to have abnormally high levels 
although they're not expected to break records. While the higher water will mean narrower beaches, it will help commercial shippers in shallow channels. The lakes have recovered since hitting record lows just six, months, six years ago. The USS Hornet, an American aircraft carrier, launched 1942's famous Doolittle bombing raid over Tokyo. It's the last aircraft carrier to go down in combat. Now, 77 years later, crews are searching to find it. They invited Mark Phillips along for the expedition. Here's his story. Good morning and welcome to somewhere in the South Pacific and to the search for the USS Hornet, one of the most fabled carriers of the Second World War. You might think looking for an aircraft carrier, something so big, would be a straightforward thing. But it's a big ocean, and around here, it's about three miles deep. And the first question is where to start looking. The search begins in Iron Bottom Sound, the infamous graveyard for ships and men around Guadalcanal, where some of the most intense and costly naval battles of the Second World War were fought and where the research vessel Petrel and her crew begin the hunt for a wreck that's been lost for 77 years. Carriers on both sides were under almost constant air attack. The Hornet was engaged in the 1942 battle for control of the skies over Guadalcanal. U.S. forces fought off counter blows. Where U.S. Marines were holding a crucial airstrip the Japanese desperately wanted back. It was a new kind of sea war with the planes functioning as the principal attack weapon. I looked up, and here was a Japanese dive bomber on his way down with his tracer bullets coming out of his wings right at me. We spoke to Richard Nowatsky on a video link. He was 18 that day on the Hornet. He's 95 now. The two torpedoes that came in, it, it took that Hornet and shook it just like a dog with a bone. And then we started listing over to the right and no power. We stopped dead in the water. The Hornet was finished. 140 of her crew were dead. The rest ordered to abandon ship. The Japanese then sank her. The tactical victory for the enemy. The Hornet became another wartime tragedy, another lost grave. Out of the bridge, heading change complete. Thank you, Bridge. The Petrel has come to try to find it in the vast South Pacific Ocean. About 140 square miles of ocean is what you're looking yeah, at roughly there. Yeah, indeed. And so this, this is needle in a haystack country is what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Rob Kraft and his team have done their homework. That's when they change course to go east. In a project funded by the late Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, who had a passion for maritime history, they've outfitted a state-of-the-art deep-sea research vessel. Here, this is hour-by-hour hour information. You can watch more of Mark Phillips' story this week on CBS This Morning. Now, in the market for a new truck, when a vehicle starts winning every best of awards, people take notice. That's what's happening with the new Ram 1500. We're heading behind the wheel with Harvey Briggs when News 3 Now This Morning Sunday returns.
Well, we have an alert in the forecast for today and tonight for occasional snow that could end up accumulating anywhere from three to six inches when all is said and done. Heaviest amounts over southwestern Wisconsin, two to five inches during the day today and maybe an additional inch for tonight. We also have an alert in the forecast for Tuesday night and Wednesday for a very similar storm system that could bring similar snow amounts. Doppler track showing the snow continuing over much of southern Wisconsin, although there's a little bit of a break over southern portions of Grant and Lafayette counties uh, south of a Platteville to Darlington to Monroe line, but there's another band rotating back northeastward from Iowa that will fill that in. Uh, Visibility is right now around a mile in light to moderate snow from La Crosse through Madison down towards Janesville. Quarter mile visibility to heavy snow in Kenosha. Temperatures will stay in the lower 20s this morning, climbing into the mid-20s this afternoon and back into the low 20s by early this evening. That's your first alert forecast. Thank you, Gary. When a vehicle starts winning every best of awards, people take notice. That's what's happening with the 2019 Ram 1500. It has won virtually every Truck of the Year award this year. But is it ready to take on Ford and GM? Harvey Briggs thinks so as we, behind, as we show you behind the wheel in the Ram 1500. So you got your Ford guys. You got your Chevy guys, we got a divided nation. Yep, and now you got your Ram guys, and they're coming on strong in the awards, in sales, and you know, people size? really yeah, <laughs> size. It it ain't small. It ain't small. You can say that again. And it's got a Hemi. We've got a 5.7 liter Hemi V8 in this thing. You've got four-wheel drive, you've got all the room in the world in this uh, crew cab, and you got a truck that is tall enough to lean on for a guy like me. <laughs> the Ram 1500 has a reputation as a tough and dependable pickup truck, and now completely redesigned for 2019, it hasn't abandoned what it does best. Optional coil springs in the rear delivers a smooth ride without sacrificing towing or hauling capabilities. So theoretically, this could be your daily driver. It could be your daily driver, but you better have a very big parking <laughs> space. You know, we could have taken this to a farm, a construction site, yeah. or a subdivision. Exactly. You know, I, you can wear the you can you can wear a suit and a tie with this truck, or you can wear your your car hearts. These trucks are being used more and more as family vehicles because of the amount of space you have in these. I mean, you've got. Plenty of room for five full-size adults back here. Look at the leg room back here. This is bigger, as big as a Rolls-Royce Ghost back here. And then you can flip up. You've got a lot of storage underneath here. And it's not just the room that makes the Ram stand out from the competition. This is the best interior in pickup trucks by a long shot. This is why this truck win, has been winning all the awards. The centerpiece of the interior is the 12-inch Uconnect screen. It controls everything. Think of it as like a tablet in your dashboard. You can have um, your radio up here and you can put, say, your climate settings down here and control that. And if you say, well, I, I really want these up top, then you just hit that and it flops. And then you got some manly buttons. Don't oh you? yeah, for <laughs> all your good stuff. So if you wanna go into tow haul mode, you hit that button. And the quality doesn't stop there. Look at the stitching on here, the leather. And it's not just on these surfaces where you expect it, but right here, this grab handle, this is one of those little touches, those little things that you go, they really started to think about it in terms of a more premium vehicle. Yeah. A premium vehicle with premium pricing. The basic model of the 1500, the Tradesman, is $34,000 for two-wheel drive. Then you go up through the Bighorn and the Lone Star to the Laramie and Rebel, up to our test model, a top-of-the-line limited crew cab. With the $1,000 optional Ram box storage area, it clocks in at $68,000 and change. And somehow that's a bargain? Someone used to pay $40,000 for a pickup truck and $50,000 for a nice car. And now they get both in one. So maybe it's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> With your full forecast next on News 3 Now this morning. But first, let's wish a very happy birthday to all those turning three today. Thanks for celebrating with us on News 3 Now this morning.
Well, the snow continues to fall over southern Wisconsin. It's going to continue that way for pretty much uh, the entire day today into this evening. We have an alert day in the forecast for today for two to five inches of snow by evening with the heaviest amounts over southwestern Wisconsin and maybe an additional inch of snow tonight before it comes to an end. And then we have another alert day in the forecast from Tuesday night into Wednesday for a very similar storm system that could bring us similar snow amounts somewhere maybe in the two to five or six inch range. Visibility is right now uh, dropping in a few spots. Madison at one mile visibility, but down to three quarters of a mile in Lone Rock and also in Viroqua. That's where the heaviest band of snow is. There's a little bit of break over southwestern Wisconsin, Platteville up to a 10 mile visibility, Dubuque back down to seven miles, and then farther to the south and west, another band of snow is developing and heading northeastward. So you can see that that little break over southwestern Wisconsin will fill in pretty rapidly over the next couple of hours. And for most areas, it'll just continue to snow pretty steadily for much of the day. Not particularly heavy at any given time, but a steady snow. Uh, visibilities to the south and west in that second band of snow already down to three quarters of a mile in Iowa City. So again, uh, that snow will pick up in intensity once that little break fills in. Winter weather advisories in effect uh, through midnight tonight or 3 a.m. tomorrow morning from Madison on toward the south and west. Winter storm warning in effect for areas west of Des Moines, Iowa. The live view from the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison. Looks like the snow has picked up in intensity uh, again as we check out the current conditions. We're 23 degrees. Winds out of the east northeast at 13 miles per hour. Drop our wind chill to 11 degrees. The storm system is kind of strung out from southern Wisconsin back into the Dakotas. The upper level low pressure system kind of spinning around here and will follow along the jet stream. So that'll keep the snow going for much of the day today into tonight. The main area of low pressure, we got one area in, in uh, Iowa. The main area is actually back into southwestern Kansas. Eventually, these two will kind of come together and head eastward, taking most of the precipitation with it over the next uh, 24 hours or so. So the snow should wind down pretty rapidly later on tonight. Following that, temperatures will turn a little colder. We'll probably make the mid-20s for highs today and drop into the low 20s tomorrow. Some of this colder air where temperatures are in the single digits above and below zero to the north and west gradually work their way eastward. Wind chills right now, teens and 20s below zero across the western uh, Dakotas. But the storm system will head off to the east tonight. Notice the snow winding down. Tomorrow, maybe a couple of flurries in the morning, and then a few breaks in the clouds in the afternoon. Tuesday, we'll see some sunshine, and then look what happens for the next weather system. Already starting to gain strength and head northeastward, and that'll be in here sometime Tuesday night into Wednesday, again with the potential for more snow accumulations. So we have winter weather advisory for Dane County in areas to the south and west through 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. Our western viewers until midnight tonight. Look for uh, temperatures to climb into the mid-20s by lunchtime with the snow continuing steadily through the morning and into this afternoon. This afternoon's high temperature at 26. For tonight, we're back down to a low temperature of 14 degrees as the snow tapers the flurries with maybe an additional inch of accumulation. Tomorrow, any flurries end in a high temperature at 23. Future track, the snow continues through the morning and into the afternoon, winds down for tonight. Temperatures drop off into the mid-teens, then highs tomorrow in the lower 20s with some breaks in the clouds. As we look at the seven or uh, snowfall amounts, three to six inches from Madison toward the south and west, lighter amounts in the northern parts of our viewing area. Seven to 10 day forecast, again, another storm system Wednesday, perhaps another one toward next weekend with a mix of precipitation changing to snow and then some light snow by Tuesday of the following week. As far as pet walk is concerned, hey, these kitties have the right idea. Steve, Sully and Smalls all sleeping. 3 p.m. temperature here in Madison, 26 degrees with light snow continuing. Maddie, I think those cats have the right idea. They absolutely do. I'm a little jealous of them. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Sure. Well, this snow, of course, good for a snowball fight. That's what they uh, thought last night. We'll show you a wintry battle playing out on Bascom Hill. Every year, the battle for Bascom Hill pits UW-Madison students from the southeast and the Lakeshore residence halls against each other in an epic snowball fight. This year, the event brought out a group of freshmen from the southeast residence hall for the first time. We caught up with them as they described their strategy before the fight. But do we do feel outnumbered, which I think is the biggest yeah. threat. But if well, we just get them in the mental game, oh, yeah. maybe yeah. if we we'll can psych them the out. Game. I mean, we're on their side right now, which yeah. is good. Um, so I think that we're in a good spot to win this one. This is the 10th year of the snowball fight. Now there's more news ahead all day long here on News 3 Now tonight at 530 and 10. But first, a final check of weather is right after this.
Well, there's Doppler track. You can see one band of snow moving through Madison, a little bit of a break over southwestern Wisconsin. The next band starting to move in from Iowa, so that will fill in pretty quickly. Visibility is right now down to three quarters of a mile in Lone Rock. You can see that where that heavier band runs from Kenosha and Waukesha, where they have half mile visibilities and moderate snow. And then that second band just south and west of Dubuque, Iowa. Current temperatures in the lower 20s will end up in the mid 20s this afternoon. Snowfall amounts about three to six inches, heaviest amounts down toward Grant County. Winter weather advisory for Dane County and areas of the south and west through uh, 3 a.m. for our western viewers until midnight. Uh, another alert day in the forecast for Tuesday night and Wednesday for a storm with similar snow totals to what we're seeing today and then another storm toward next weekend with maybe a wintry mix of precipitation just for good weather and make it mixed up a little bit. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tonight.